Hey everyone, it's Sirta, and I am back to talk to you about a book by George Saunders. I know I've done a bunch of videos about his short stories, so this is pretty exciting. It is his one and only novel, Lincoln in the Bardo. So the Bardo is, um, I didn't know what this was before I read the book. It's like a Buddhist term for, the way I understood it is like limbo, after you die, before you go on to somewhere else. Um, this book takes place in that, in that place, um, which can make it a little bit strange. And this book was really hard for me at first to get into. Um, I was not really vibing with what he was doing. And I'll just explain. What he's doing is um, using the voices of a bunch of different ghosts in a cemetery and they are all sort of narrating this at the same time. So to give you an idea, like that's what most of the pages look like. And interspersed throughout that, there are pages of quotes that claim to be from the time period. So this book is about Abraham Lincoln and his son. Um, I mean, that's the framework. I'll read you the back here. It says, February 1862, with the Civil War less than one year old, President Lincoln's beloved 11-year-old son, Willie, lies gravely ill. In a matter of days, Willie dies and is laid to rest in a Georgetown cemetery. Newspapers report that a grief-stricken Lincoln returns alone to the crypt several times to hold his boy's body. From that seed of historical truth, George Saunders spins an unforgettable story that breaks free of its realistic framework into a thrilling supernatural realm deploying a kaleidoscopic theatrical panorama of voices, living and dead, historical and invented, to ask a timeless question. How do we live and love when we know that everything we love must end? Um, to be honest, if this wasn't George Saunders and I read that description, I'd probably never pick it up because I'm not one for supernatural as soon as I see the word supernatural. Not into ghosts, not into magical realism. Um, I like high fantasy, things like that, or just regular old fantasy. I like sci-fi, but this this whole ghost thing, it was hard for me to grapple with at first. But because it's George Saunders and he knows what he's doing, I was getting into it by the end. Definitely not my favorite of his stories, but I see what he was doing and, um, you know, it's highly acclaimed. That doesn't always mean anything, but it won the Man Booker Prize. And I saw that and I was like, oh, I think Milkman won that too. And I really did not enjoy reading that book. So um, kind of a similar issue where I feel like there's some stream of consciousness stuff going on here, um, but not so much in one person's brain spread out over a whole cemetery full of ghosts who don't know they're dead. Um, so if that's not your thing, it might be hard for you. The historical aspect, the supernatural aspect, the, these might be roadblocks for some people. Um, just to warn you, if you have read his, uh, his short story Civil Warland and Bad Decline, it you can really see where the seeds for this story, this book, came from. He, he clearly has a thing for this time period and for ghosts and um, I love that he was able to bring all that together in this book. It's really fun when you read an author's whole body of work and you can see them working through different ideas as time goes on and, and things will come back in their next story and you just go, oh, I know where that came from, I've seen you do this before and now you're getting to um, fully realize it, which is quite nice. So, one thing about this is that the quotes in here, where it says things like, you know, account of Sophie Lennox made, and like, all these historical things, it, the book will be kind of following what Lincoln is doing after Willie dies, um, Willie being in the Bardo and all the ghosts being like, Willie, you need to get out of here, you're not supposed to linger like this, um, you know, you did. They don't know that. Like, spoiler alert, 
most of the ghosts are pretty unaware that they are dead. They think they're going to come back at some point and they're just sick, which is very, very sad. Um, but so it follows Lincoln going through his grieving process and alongside that there will be these historical quotes, historical quotes, um, that follow the action. So, um, the party that the Lincolns threw when Willie was on his deathbed, there will be quotes about that and then quotes about the funeral and then quotes about Lincoln going to, um, hold Willie's body in the crypt. And so I initially thought, oh, all these, these quotes are fake. Of course, he made them up. Like, it never even entered my head that some of them could be real. But then I read that they're real. But then I read something conflicting that some of them are real and not all of them are real. And that, I get, I get the creative license, but it kind of frustrates me because I want to know which of these historical quotes was actually written or said. Because I like some of them, and yeah, that's just me. Like, you know, you can you can write a whole piece of fiction, and I'll find a way to to wish that it was more nonfiction. I just love nonfiction. So anyway, um, the book's style, the way that it's so disjointed, and it's you know one line from this ghost and one line from this ghost, and a quote from this person and a quote from this person. It's not it's not a normal narrative. It's not a traditional narrative in any sense of the word, so throw that out the window. The style, while it was fun to, to read a completely different style um, in a novel, it kind of detached me from fully feeling everything, though I did cry a few times, but that's because I'm extremely fragile right now. Um, not sure if I would have cried normally, but um, if you have, if you are dealing with grief at all in your life, like I am, then you might really connect to it, and um, certain things might hit you harder than they would normally. Um, I found that it was it was kind of cathartic in a way to read about grief. I know some people, when they're grieving um, or when they're depressed, it does not help them to read about loss or depression or that sad things or anything like that. Um, but I kind of feel comforted, and it, it comforted me, you know that that Abraham Lincoln all those years ago went through such a horrific loss. Um, I mean, obviously his life then ended tragically too, but yeah, it just, it makes you feel a little bit less alone and to hear all of these ghosts kind of dealing with what happened to them while they were alive and uh, not being able to cope with the fact that they're dead, it was kind of cathartic. Um, but that being said, you all know I prefer a first-person narrative that is largely um, a character study with no plot. That's just me. Um, ghosts in a cemetery from... what does that say? Oh, from different periods of time. So all of these ghosts... I was trying to figure it out. If the cemetery... let's say the cemetery was founded in 1700, I have no idea when, but let's say it was. And then you have ghosts there from that time period up until now, which is 1862, anybody that died within that time frame. So that made it kind of interesting once I realized, oh, there's some really outdated ghosts here and some more, um, you know, modern ghosts. And that was made clear with this, like, super racist guy um, whose who's <laughs> thoughts and opinions were even more outdated than the racist opinions of people in the 1860s. Uh, which is saying a lot. And keep in mind, this is the time when, you know, Lincoln is president and abolishing slavery, the abolishment of slavery is coming. So it had a, an interesting historical aspect to it, but that was not at all, like, hitting you over the head or trying to be the main focus of the novel. I really think the main focus is what he says. Um, this, wait, I think I actually have a do I have a quote? Um, yeah, George Saunders has described the question at the core of this book as, how do we continue to love in a world in which the objects of our love are so conditional? And then it asks, did you find this to be true and do you feel like you came to a deeper understanding of mortality? So yeah, I do feel like that's the central thing. It's not, it's not like, I, I didn't know what to tell people when I was reading it because I couldn't really say, oh, I'm reading a book about Lincoln because it doesn't feel like that. Um, it is, very out there. 
while at the same time grounded through the framework of grief and loss and things that we all experience, mortality and all that. So, but I will say I did want more, more of that feeling, if that makes sense, um, because it was so detached by using the voices of all of these other people and so many other people and I really struggle when there are a lot of narrators um, because of that it sort of like keeps you one step away from being fully um, in the subject of grief and loss and um, the temporary aspect of human existence life existence animal existence all existence um, it is all temporary. So yeah, I just wanted to feel that a little bit more. Um, but I, I would love to know if you've read this and it, and it resonated with you even more than it did with me, because I can see how it, how it would. Um, all right, I'm just going to read, as usual, some things that stood out for me in the book. And a lot of these are going to be sad things about grief. One is thunderstruck that such a brutal violation has occurred in what had previously seemed a benevolent world. From nothingness there arose great love. Now its source nullified. That love, searching and sick, converts to the most abysmal suffering imaginable. And it says that is from Essay Upon the Loss of a Child by Mrs. Rose Milland. Um, so that theme of losing a child, it's so beyond heartbreaking, it's soul-shattering, and there's a lot of good bits in here about that. Um, I just liked that line because there was there was nothing, and then and then there was this child, this dependent thing that you love, um, and then when it's gone, the, the suffering that comes is is the most indescribable kind of suffering. Happy stuff. Um, I think this is a bit where sometimes the ghosts can like slither into Lincoln and like inhabit him and, and listen to his thoughts. And I believe this is Lincoln thinking. Um, trap, horrible trap. At one's birth it is sprung, some last day must arrive when you will need to get out of this body. Bad enough. Then we bring a baby here. The terms of the trap are compounded. But the baby also must depart. All pleasure pleasures should be tainted by that knowledge, but hopeful dear us, we forget. Lord, what is this? All of this walking about, trying, smiling, bowing, joking, this sitting down at table, pressing of shirts, tying of ties, shining of shoes, planning of trips, singing of songs in the bath when he is to be left out here. Is a person to nod, dance, reason, walk, discuss, as before? A parade passes. He can't rise and join. Am I to run after it, take my place, lift knees high, wave a flag, blow a horn? Was he dear or not? Then let me be happy no more. So again, we have this theme of mortality, and Lincoln's thinking about how oh, you know that eventually you're going to die, you know, we, we're well aware of our own demise coming, but you, you kind of put it out of your mind when it comes to your children, um, mainly because probably you don't think you're going to outlive them, um, or it's just too horrible to imagine outliving them that you don't think about it, because they seem eternal. They're this, your greatest source of joy, this wonderful, um, biggest part of your life. And so then thinking, this, this baby also must depart. Um, you know, how are we supposed to, how are we supposed to enjoy life at all when we have that knowledge? Where he says all pleasures should be tainted by that knowledge. So the only way that we can continue and do anything and enjoy the present moment is by putting that out of our mind, because if we sit and think about the mortality of our children, that will destroy us.
I just uh, I love the way that it's phrased, kind of so simply, but in a very deep way. Um, so this bit, there's this reverend character, one of the ghosts, and he finds out that um, he ooh, that he would be going to hell, and um, that's why he's in the bardo because um, he didn't he doesn't want to go on because his going on would be going to hell, and he can't figure out why he was damned. Um, he says, "Was it my occasional period of doubt?" Was it that I sometimes lusted? Was it my pride when I had resisted my lust? Was it the timidity I showed by not following my lust? Was it that I wasted my life fulfilling outward forms? Did I, in my familial affairs, commit some indiscretion, oversight, or failing that, failing that now escapes my memory? Okay, so basically, my thought on that is, um, we can never be perfect, and uh, if you if you're not if you are new here, you don't know this. But if you've been watching my videos, I'm an atheist. I feel religion is very dangerous, and so this is a perfect example of we can never be good enough in the eyes of this holy creator that is supposed to pass judgment upon us at the end of our lives, and it is ridiculous to spend our time dissecting it like this the way I mean the way he just lays it out like that was it was it lust was it pride when we resist lust was it timidity by not following lust it's just you cannot win so live your life according to good values and don't expect any sort of reward or punishment when you die that's what I think Just be nice to each other and be nice to yourself. I mean, oh, wouldn't it be so wonderful if everybody was just nice? If we just helped each other and we didn't have to be afraid of each other. Um, but I'm living in a dream. Okay, this one really messed me up. When a child is lost, there is no end to the self-torment a parent may inflict. When we love and the object of our love is small, weak, and vulnerable, and has looked to us and us alone for protection, and when such protection, for whatever reason, has failed, what consolation, what justification, what defense may there possibly be? None. Doubt will fester as long as we live, and when one occasion of doubt has been addressed, another and then another will arise in its place. <sighs> so this one made me cry because this is a great example of the way that that grief and guilt hang out together in my brain. Um, and I, I'm sure that a lot of people share this unfortunate problem with me, in that you, when there is a loss coming or the, the loss that happened, you question what you did and what you could have done differently and how you might have saved this loved one. Um, just absolutely every little moment that could have gone differently so that there would would have been a better outcome. Um, and like it says, when it's your child or when it's, you know, a, a creature that is small, weak, and vulnerable and looks to you for protection, even if you've done all that you can do, how do you cope with that loss? Because it's like their life was in your hands and you failed. Um, even, even if that's not the rational way of looking at it, that's how it can feel when you are um, deep in grief and it's so cruel it's so cruel that you're already grieving and then the guilt just compounds everything okay here's a good bit about the temporary um, nature of existence and this is Lincoln thinking again I was in error when I saw him as fixed and stable, and thought I would have him forever. He was never fixed, nor stable, but always just a passing temporary energy burst. I had reason to know this. Had he not looked this way at birth, that way at four, another way at seven, been made entirely anew at nine? He had never stayed the same, even instant to instant. He came out of nothingness, took form, was loved, 
was always bound to return to nothingness. Only I did not think it would be so soon, or that he would precede us. Two passing temporarinesses developed feelings for one another. Two puffs of smoke became mutually fond. I mistook him for a solidity, and now must pay. I am not stable, and Mary not stable, and the very buildings and monuments here not stable, and the greater city not stable, and the wide world not stable, and alter are all alter are altering in every instant. So again, a really good way of wording that, that um, these two temporary things developed feelings for one another. Um, you know, a father and a son both came from nothing, were born, became who they are, loved each other, and both of them are doomed to return to nothingness. So I don't really know what I think, you know, about the, the overarching question of this book, which again is how do we... How do we love when we know that the things we love are temporary? Time is fleeting. Um, I think the way I do it, and the way I've been trying to think about it more lately, is, is quality, not quantity. So we know that we will never have enough time with our loved ones. It'll never be enough. Um, but the quality of our love, the strength of our love, that is enough. It has to be. It's all we have. Um, so here Willie is still trapped in the bardo, and it's not a good place for him. Tell them that we work to save a boy, Mr. Volman said, whose only sin is that he is a child, and the architect of this place has, for reasons we cannot know, deemed that to be a child and to love one's life enough to desire to stay here is, in this place, a terrible sin, worthy of the most severe punishment. I like the, the way that they, um... They protect this boy and really honor childhood and innocence. And all of these ghosts have been through really terrible things in their lives. Most of their deaths were pretty terrible. And um, they, it's like in a sense they do know that they're dead, even though they won't admit it to themselves because they, they desperately want to get Willie out of this place because they know it's not right for him. And even though you know, Willie might be clinging to life by staying in the Bardo because he loved his life so much. The ghosts know that it's it's not healthy. And they recognize how unfair that is, that, that a child who loves his life should be forced to leave it behind. Here's another bit about guilt. What was the name of that woman whose daughter was struck by lightning in Ponce's hayfield? Just before walking through, the two of them had been talking about peaches, the different varieties of peaches which kind each preferred. For nights after, they found her wandering ponces, mumbling about peaches, searching for that juncture of the conversation at which she might jump the breach of time and go back, push the girl aside, take the fatal bolt herself. She could not accept that it had happened, but must go over it and over it. Oof, that one was painful. Because that's exactly what I was just talking about, where you... Even if... It makes no sense that, that you would have known there was a bolt of lightning coming. Um, you just forever blame yourself, and you think, you start to make up, and maybe this is part of um, the bargaining aspect of, of um, grieving, where you think, if I can just figure out exactly the word that I was saying when she was hit by that bolt of lightning, I, I can somehow work out either a way in which I could have saved her, or a way in which this is all my fault. And one thing I've been thinking about guilt and grief lately is it is terrifying to think that things are out of our control, so we can't save our loved ones. That's terrifying. We want to think if we just get them the right doctors, if we do all the things, if we spend all the money, if we take all the time and we care for them, that we can save them. Well, that isn't always the case. And so if we don't have full control, that's super scary. If we do have control, though, and we believe that this is all in our hands, this life is in our hands, and we fail, then that's even more devastating, isn't it? Wouldn't you rather be out of control than have all the control and this life is lost anyway? And the fact is, we don't have control, so basically we just have to come to terms with the fact that certain things 
are out of our hands, which is easier said than done. So going back to loving life, there is this wonderful passage here that just lists all of these things that you might totally take for granted, but when you are faced with the fact that you have died or you're going to die, suddenly all of these things feel really beautiful. Um, so I'm going to read that for you. And there was nothing left for me to do but go. To, sorry, dog walking. And there was nothing left for me to do but go. Though the things of the world were strong with me still, such as, for example, a gaggle of children trudging through a side-blown December flurry, a friendly match share beneath some collision-tilted streetlight, a frozen clock bird-visited within its high tower, cold water from a tin jug, toweling off one's clinging shirt post-June rain, pearls, rags, buttons, rug-tuft, beer froth, someone's kind wishes for you, someone remembering to write, Someone noticing that you were not at all at ease. A bloody roast death red on a, on a platter, a hedge top underhand as you flee late to some chalk and wood fire smelling schoolhouse, geese above, clover below, the sound of one's own breath when winded, the way a moistness in the eye will blur a field of stars, the sore place on the shoulder a resting toboggan makes, writing one's beloved's name upon a frosted window with a gloved finger, tying a shoe, Tying a knot on a package, a mouth on yours, a hand on yours, the ending of the day, the beginning of the day, the feeling that there will always be a day ahead. Goodbye. I must now say goodbye to all of it. Loon call in the dark, calf cramp in the spring, neck rub in the parlor, milk sip at end of day. It does go on further. I'm just like, it's so good. It's so beautiful. Um, I really admire writers who can pick details like that and use them so effectively and I'm just a sucker for a good long list and um, especially an, an emotional list and I love the way he uses this is where you can kind of see like this is George Saunders because if you've read him before his use of the English language is so wild and I love the way he um, he kind of does that here where he says, a frozen clock, bird visited, and that's hyphenated. You know, bird visited, like when have you seen that as a phrase hyphenated before? Um, there's a lot of hyphenated things in here. The way that he links words together is just really lovely. Okay, almost done. I didn't think I had so much to say. Whew. Um and discover in those first moments of restored movement that we had again been granted the great mother gift. Time. More time. And what I think is that, yeah, that's what the ghosts think is the ultimate gift. More time. They just want more time. They want to go back to their life and have more time there. Well, I don't think time is the ultimate gift, and that is what I was just saying. Um, it's not about the quantity of time. If you love a living being in this world. Is there truly ever enough time that you could spend with them? If you really think about it, do you ever get to the point where you think, ah, oh, right then, okay, I've had enough, I've had enough time. And I don't mean when you've fallen out of love with someone or um, anything like that. You still love this person or this animal and w would you ever just think you've had enough time? No. So it, it kind of is a bit silly to expect that anything less than infinity would be enough. So maybe time, maybe we should place a little bit less importance on time and more on enjoying the only thing that actually exists, which is right here, right now. And that is so much easier said than done, but I've been working on it. Um, it does get easier to kind of snap yourself out of it when you when you leave the present moment but it's it's a lifelong journey i think i mean that's the sort of thing that people spend years practicing meditation to try and achieve just always staying in the moment and i don't think like normal people can always do that but 
um, it is something to to just kind of remember when you're floating out of a moment or you're starting to think, oh, I wish I had more time with them. Um, or, you know, regretting or something when you've already lost some somebody. Don't think so much about, oh, they didn't get as many years as they should have, because trust me, I've spent my time thinking about that. I still do. But, you know, what happened within those years or months even? Was it good? What do you remember? And then bring yourself back to the present. So let's end on this. This is the on the last page here. There's just this really nice moment where a ghost um, is following Lincoln out of the cemetery and he goes into the horse that Lincoln is riding. And it's just a nice little horse thought. Um... I dozed and slipped through him into his horse, who was, I felt at that moment, pure patience, head to hoof, and fond of the man, and never before had I felt oats to be such a positive thing in the world, or so craved a certain blue blanket. And then I roused myself and sat up straight and fully rejoined the gentleman. Oh, I just thought that was like within just, just two little descriptors, oats and a certain blue blanket. I was just fully transported into that horse. I was just like, yep, I am horse. Horse is me. I know what it's like. Beautiful, crisp, clear descriptions. Um, thank you, George Saunders. I love you. I hope that he puts out another collection of short stories. And even um, that he might write another novel. I just was reading that he is going to return to short stories, or this was probably years ago, this thing that I was reading online, because this is from 2017, um, that he enjoyed working for years on the same project, but he's definitely going to continue with short stories as well. Um, interestingly, I was on Netflix recently and saw a movie called Spiderhead on there, and I thought, well, that sounds familiar. Could that be? And it was. It was based on Escape from Spiderhead, which is in 10th of December by George Saunders. So that was really exciting to see a film adaptation of a short story. You know, short stories kind of get swept aside. They're not, um, they're not given their due, I think, most of the time. Especially if they're by people who aren't as lauded as George Saunders, because he's really up there. You know, I mean, you should see some of the, the quotes in here. Um, let's see the work of a great writer. There's some that are like, it's not like anything anyone has written before. The author may have set out to write his first novel, but the work he completed is a genre unto itself. I mean, he's just very, very um, accomplished and respected. So like anybody who's, who's less known than that writing short stories, forget about it. Like, I, I never hear about short stories and I don't think I've seen any no, actually, I have seen one other film that was based on a short story, which was Drive My Car, Haruki Murakami, and that somehow was turned into, like, a three-and-a-half-hour movie. That was, like, what? Um, very long movie. Anyway, tangent. So, yeah, if you cannot handle at all the, like, a weird style in a narrative, or, um, you can't handle ghosts, or, um, 1862, then maybe it's not for you, but I do recommend that you put your preconceptions about all of those things aside because this is totally unique. It's a really weird book. Like, just thinking of it as a book is kind of hard because it is, it's just so bizarre. Um, it's definitely unlike anything I've ever read. Um, so yeah, I'm all about broadening horizons and trying new things, and I think you should read it if you want to do that. That is all I'm gonna say, I guess, although it seems I could just keep talking. I doubt that, like, almost anybody makes it to the end of these videos. If you do, um, say something weird so, so that I know you made it. But yeah, thanks for watching, and I should be back very soon, possibly the end of the week, with another book. I'm finally, like, managing to read at a semi-normal pace. So, until then, happy reading.